why is success so difficult to sustain? If you look across the sweep of business history, most companies, which at one point were widely regarded as unassailably successful, a decade or two later you find them in the middle of the pack and often at the bottom of the heap. And I reached the strangest conclusion uh, after having studied this for a number of years, which is that it's actually the principles of good management that we teach at the Harvard Business School that sow the seeds of every company's ultimate failure. I will uh, begin by just showing you this diagram on the screen that plots on the vertical axis the performance of a product or service over time. And this is a model that we call the disruptive innovation model that describes how new technologies can overtake an industry and transform the way it's, uh, their products or services are delivered. In every market, there are two trajectories of improvement. The first, which is represented by this dotted red line, is that in every market there's a trajectory of improvement that uh, customers are able to utilize. Now, there's a distribution in every market. So at the high end, there are very complicated problems and very demanding customers where they'll never, never be satisfied with the best that's available. And at the low end of every market, there are simple problems and simple folks that can be overserved by very little. So that's the first piece of the model, is in every market there's this trajectory of improvement that customers can use. Now the second piece of the model is that in every market there's a different trajectory of improvement that innovating companies provide as they keep introducing better and better products. The most important finding about this is this trajectory of technological progress almost always outstrips the ability of customers to use the progress. And a good way to visualize this is if you just go back to the mid-1980s on the left-hand side of that diagram, when we were first learning to do word processing on those early personal computers, do you remember how often you had to stop your fingers to let Intel's 286 chip catch up to you? Because Intel's fastest processor wasn't even fast enough to keep pace with your fingers. But Intel just keep, kept introducing faster and faster chips until a few years ago when they hit a 3 gigahertz Pentium 4 processor that actually shot way beyond the speed that most customers in mainstream business applications could use. Now, some of the innovations that help companies move up that trajectory of improvement are just simple incremental year-to-year -year, uh, innovations that every good company can grind out. Others of them are really dramatic breakthrough technologies. So for example, in telecommunications, the transition from analog to digital and digital to optical signaling each cost billions of dollars in some of the world's finest technical minds to leapfrog beyond what the old technology could do. What we found, though, is that the purpose of both was the same, and that was the incremental and the radical uh, were developed to sustain that trajectory of improvement that the leaders in the market were trying to blaze. And we found that invariably the companies that were the leaders in the industry on the left hand side of the diagram before these battles of sustaining innovation began almost always found themselves still on top of the industry when those battles were over. And it really doesn't matter technologically how difficult it is. It just seemed in our study as if if the technology helped the leaders in the industry make better products that they could sell for better profits to their best customers, they always figured out a way to get it done. But there was another technology that always vexed the leaders and in the end generally killed them. And we called this kind of technological innovation a disruptive technology. We chose the word disruptive not because it was a dramatic breakthrough of the, short, of the sort shown on this slide, but instead of making a better product perform better, it actually brought to the market a product that was simpler, much more affordable, and not nearly as good as the ones that you're looking at there. And in almost every industry at the beginning, the available products are expensive and complicated, so only people with a lot of money and a lot of skill 
can own them and use them or provide the services that they entail. A disruptive innovation transforms those products into something that is so affordable and simple that a whole new population of people can now own the products and use them or provide the services. And so to depict that on this diagram, we're going to come out in a, th a new plane of competition where the disruptive innovation by enabling people who previously couldn't afford or own the product now to have one. And we say that it competes against non-consumption. Now a great example of a disruptive innovation is the personal computer. I remember when I got out of grad school, if I needed to compute, I had to take a stack of punched cards to the corporate mainframe center and give it to a PhD who ran the job for us. The computer cost several million dollars. And because of its expense and its complexity and the inconvenience, we really just didn't compute very much. But the personal computer made it so affordable and simple that even a poor fool like Clay Christensen could own a computer and use it. At the beginning, all we could do is the simplest of problems. We could type, do spreadsheet analysis on our PCs, but we still had to take the complicated problems back to the mainframe center and give it to the expert who did the work. But out in this new plane of competition, as the PC got better and better and better, one by one, we could do in the affordable, simple plane of competition problems that in the past had to be done on the mainframe and it drew the applications one by one out of the back into the front until ultimately every supplier of mainframe and mini computers vaporized. Now this, and so almost always disruptive innovations allow entrants to come into an industry and ultimately kill the incumbents through this process of starting simple and then improving. Now this simple model was very useful to me in understanding a puzzle that I brought with me when I became an academic. And that was just living here in the Boston area, watching that very successful computer company, Digital Equipment Corporation, collapse in the early 90s. Now the reason why digital's demise was such a puzzle is that through the 1970s and through most of the 80s, Digital equipment was probably the most widely admired of all the companies in the world economy. And when you read explanations about why this company was so successful, always the success was attributed to the quality and capability of the management team. And then about 1988, digital equipment just fell off the cliff and began to unravel very quickly. And when you then read explanations in the business press about why the company stumbled so badly, always it was attributed to the ineptitude of the management team. And it was the very same people running the company on both sides of that hill. Well, for a while I framed the question as, gosh, I wonder how good managers could get that stupid that fast. And that really is the common explanation that most people give and accept for digital's demise as well as most companies that stumble. And that is that somehow a management team that had its act together at one point found itself out of its league at another. But the reason why the dumb management hypothesis just didn't feel right for me is that every mini computer company in the world collapsed in unison. It wasn't just digital, but Data General, Prime, Wang, Nixdorf, Hewlett Packard. And you'd expect these guys to collude on price occasionally, but to collude to collapse was a stretch. There just had to be a more fundamental reason why the whole population of computer companies were killed in unison. And this model was quite helpful. So I just ask you to go back, and these kinds of computers don't exist anymore, so you have to go back in your memory to recall that digital's products were called mini computers because they were a lot smaller than mainframes that filled a whole room. But these mini computers were still as big as a filing cabinet. Very complicated and expensive. They cost about $250,000 to buy. And the selling process involved a lot of training, support, and service. In order to play in the mini computer game, you just had to have those kinds of costs in your company. Given those kinds of economics, 
Digital had to generate about 45% gross profit margins on computers that sold for a quarter million dollars in order to make money, and that was their economic model. During the 1980s in their company, as in every company, people were coming into senior management all of the time with ideas for new products that they should invest in. Some of the ideas entailed making better mini computers than digital had ever made before. In fact, these would be so good that digital could reach up into the tiers of the market where historically people had had to buy even more expensive mainframe computers. If you look at those business plans, they promise gross margins of 60%, and you could earn that percentage on computers that sold for a half million dollars. Now, while management was deciding whether they should go up in that direction, other people were coming to management saying, no, you guys, you don't get it. The future is with the personal computer. Just look out the window. They're everywhere. Well, management could look out the window, and indeed they could see these PCs everywhere. But they also saw a couple of other things. First, do you remember how crummy those early personal computers were? In fact, Apple sold the Apple II as a toy to children. And that meant the more carefully digital listened to its customers and tried to reflect the customer's unmet needs in the properties of their next products, they got no signal from their customers that the PC mattered because in fact it didn't to them. And then when they looked at the business plans, it got a lot worse because in the very best of years, they promised gross margins of, of 40%. They were headed to 20% quickly, and they could only earn those paltry percentages on computers that sold for 2,000 bucks. So really, the choice that management had to make as the PC was emerging was, I wonder if we should make better products that we could sell for better profits to our best customers or alternatively, maybe we ought to produce worse products that none of our customers would buy that would ruin our profit margins. What should we do? And it really is a dilemma um, because these principles of good management that we teach at our business schools, that is, you should always listen to your best customers and give them what they need, and you should always invest in those alternatives that promise the most attractive profit margins. Those principles of good management provide very good guidance to the leaders as they move up that sustaining trajectory in the rear plane. But when one of these disruptive innovations emerges, and again the disruption transforms a complicated, expensive product or service into something that's affordable and simple, those principles of good management paralyze well-run companies 